Welcome to today's special event with Domino Data Lab. Unleashing exceptional performance. We have a packed agenda for you today, so let's get started. Medicine, I think, is a test of our ability to handle extreme complexity. When the world of complexity has become so great that you need multiple people involved in the course of care, then having lots of people who have professional freedom and autonomy and don't talk to one another and don't coordinate anything can be a total mess for care. So you can have great people in terrible care. The checklist is just a tool in one way. But it, it is something deeply cultural about how we think of ourselves. I think we'll realize that they are transformative. joining us today. I'm Matthew Grenade, one of the co-founders of Domino Data Labs. We have a very exciting event, so let's jump right in. Our first guest is Dr. Atul Gawande. He's a surgeon at Brigham Women's Hospital and a professor at both Harvard Medical School and the Chan School of Public Health. He's also an accomplished writer, author of four New York Times bestsellers and a regular contributor to The New Yorker. He's also a public health researcher on a variety of topics. Atul, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be here, Matt. As I mentioned, um, you've had a few vocations, doctor, surgeon, writer, um, but you also more broadly have been working to improve surgery at a systems level. Tell us a little bit about those efforts. Well, they're grounded in a basic um, way of thinking about what discovery really looks like in healthcare now um, and in medicine, and I think more broadly, which is um, for most of human history, we have been ignorant of what causes disease and what to do about it. But that has really changed in the last century in particular, but especially the last 50 years. So now our job is to recognize we have identified more than 70,000 ways the human body can fail. We've devised solutions that can improve people's lives or make them markedly better, even cure them at times. Um, and those solutions enumerate 4,000 different medical and surgical procedures and 6,000 drugs. And we have to deploy those capabilities town by town in the right way, in the right time, to everybody alive. And so we are failing at it with our current models of how you manage that kind of complexity and that kind of service that we would expect. It's, it's the wrong payment system, it's the wrong um, training, and it's the wrong systems. And the work that I'm doing that started in surgery and has branched out to lots of parts of medicine has been around making systems that could make it more reliable to do you know, what is uh, more than 30 million surgical procedures a year where um, people have, you know, it's upwards of half a million people a year who are left dead or disabled because of surgical care. And the transformation is now it's failures of execution that are our biggest problems. The majority of complications and deaths after surgery are due to failure to execute on knowledge that already exists. Hmm. So, I mean, one of the big ideas here is continuous improvement. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, as you've worked in operating rooms and, and hospitals and kind of at this whole system level, what have you learned about continuous improvement? And does it differ at the operating room level versus the hospital level versus maybe even the larger system level? Yeah, I mean, continuous improvement is an idea out of the 60s and 70s, but we really haven't applied them it to services in the way we have to manufacturing, as an example. Um, and so in our world in healthcare, as an example of a service, the major way we deal with, um, uh, we, don't even, we didn't even have the concept of thinking about continuous improvement. To the extent we did, the philosophy in healthcare was you, um, you go to lots of years of school. <laughs> We're going to teach you 
the skills to um, become your own self-improver and you will have years and years of education. I have, you know, I had almost 10 years of training before I could go into surgery. And then the assumption is you will improve yourself and solve the problems over time. Um, and that means I'll make sure that, you know, I've, that, that I've followed all sterile procedure and that I'm using all the appropriate equipment and I have the right plan and all of that kind of and stuff. And all the burdens on you. And all the burdens on individuals. And what you find is in fact, it's systems and teams of people where the failures occur. So when, when I described that, um, you know, it's about a 3% major death or disability rate from uh, major surgery, uh, the vast majority of that is failure to execute. We have got the hardest working and best trained um, people in the system, and that is their failure rate. You know, people talk about Six Sigma. We're not at one Sigma. <laughs> and so then what happens is the next level is, the public will respond by saying, this is crazy. How can you have uh, so many complications? What do you mean they, they didn't follow sterile procedure and people are being infected in hospitals all the time? I mean, you know, a million people a year. So uh, then we get to guidelines and malpractice litigation and like we are going to have um, regula regulatory approaches to bring it under control. And that makes some improvement at the edges and it's very costly and it's not very flexible. And we are only just in the last, I'd say, decade, and part of my role was really pushing this forward, is in the um, borrowing from the rest of the world, you want to systematize the behavior that you're trying to achieve. You want to make it easier to do the right thing rather than do the wrong thing. You don't want to rely on the anesthesiologist to remember that you know one pipe carries the oxygen, the other pipe carries the CO2, and if you put the wrong one to the patient, they die. Literally, you could switch the feed lines. Now they have separate fittings, so you can't get it wrong. And at a broader level, we, we designed an, a checklist for surgical care designed on the basis of saying, look, what do the best performers do? Can I systematize 19 critical behaviors that we will routinely check at the beginning and end of every operation to make sure we've, we've um, executed on those? And when we did that, we cut the death rate in surgery by half in eight cities uh, in a large scale trial, and then have deployed that capability uh, to the point now that about a decade later, we're at 75% of all the operating rooms in the world are using that kind of cockpit pilot's checklist to, um, uh, to, to carry out surgery. And even as trained, you know, the reaction within my field was not the most positive. <laughs> Nobody loves the idea of a checklist. And yet, two-minute checklist, I mean, we have places like Scotland that have now documented a 38% reduction in mortality sustained for six years um, to the point they've saved more lives, in fact, five times more lives than people died in car accidents uh, every year. Why, why was there the opposition to the checklist, or why was it not the most popular thing? And how did you overcome that? So many reasons. <laughs> um, first is there is a culture in an operating room. And I venture to say maybe in your, your working world and a lot of other working worlds. And that culture is um, the, there is, the operating room is built to work for someone other than the patient, other than the customer. It's built to work for the surgeon. So, you know, whatever the surgeon says goes, and autonomy of the, of the surgeon, the person who's brought the patient in the operating room and is making the decisions, is the highest value, and the system is built to optimize for the autonomy of the surgeon. Now you bring in a checklist and it has a different set of values. Humility, even the best surgeon and other members of the team, no matter how well experienced and pedigreed, will make mistakes, will make errors, they will have misses that um, the second value is discipline, that doing certain things the same way every time is better than having it custom for every time we do this. And third, um, that uh, is teamwork, that anybody in the room can make a contribution on any subject that's going on in that room uh, that can make it better for the outcome of the patient. And so you're directing everybody to serve what are the individual needs of this patient. Half the checklist is about communication. What is the plan of this operation? 
is there anything non-routine about this patient that we should know? Is there, um, is all the equipment ready that we would want to have ready? Uh, is there any questions anybody has? It really is that basic and that dramatically changes the culture. The, the resistance often comes from my colleagues and me myself because we, we all go in believing we are above average. <laughs> and I don't need this freaking checklist, right? We did a survey and um, uh, at the beginning, uh, e even after, uh, so the survey basically showed that even after we deployed it, um, you had 75, 80% who would say this thing um, was pain, but in the end, it didn't take that much time. Um, I found it straightforward to do, and I saw it actually make a difference in care. Mm. Uh, but there was a group always, 20 to 30%, who would say, uh, it takes too long, and it's a waste of my time. And then you'd ask, if you're having an operation, would you want it done with the checklist? 94% wanted their operations with the checklist. That's the culture that you're up against and, they, and that you have to work your way through changing in order to achieve um, a team that's actually pulling in the same direction. What have you learned about changing that kind of culture? A couple things. Um, Big Bang does not work. Uh, you cannot change a whole hospital, let alone a whole state by or, or let alone a country, by saying, everybody's going to do this now. Um, we did not see a single hospital that could say, okay, tomorrow all our operating rooms are going to do this. We had one province in Canada that mandated everybody has to use the surgical checklist. Every hospital documented within six months that, you know, we sign, that we're all doing this now as adopted as policy, and there was zero mortality change. You have to um, walk through a change process, and that means explaining why testing it on small scale, and we actually had every place do it, change the checklist to fit their environment. And it turns out, you know, the workflow in every place is slightly different, and making it work means assigning different responsibilities and different ways that your communication is going to work. Um, and then you pilot, and then you fix, and then you roll out. Um, and second, I think the big thing is it takes a lot longer than you expect. Um, implementation to get to the first quarter was a, was a year. Implementation to get the vast majority of hospitals um, underway was three to five years in countries like Scotland or the state of South Carolina where we worked to make it happen and actually measured how things went. But you could then demonstrate um, market reductions in mortality. Yeah, one, one thought I had in reading your book was that you know, a, a checklist is almost a, a record of best practice. Um, and that you know, without that record of best practice, uh, you actually end up losing a lot of learning. You know, I mean, if the individual, even if the individual is very good, they're just doing their thing, and it really almost becomes a method for a community or a group to to capture all that. I mean, is that is that how you think about it, and is that how it actually gets practiced in some of these hospitals? Yes, in fact, we call it a community of practice. Right? You you instead of having every um, every surgeon and every unit doing their own thing. You're engaging them in a regular process of reinventing what you do and learning from one another so that you are, um, uh, you are arriving at what the best practice is and you're disseminating it, you're implementing it, you're making it easier to do the right thing rather than harder to do that best practice. And, um, and there are always barriers also to making those practices happen. And, you know, in our case, there's equipment you need and training you might need to have and other steps that fit into that, that world along the way. You will have lots of disagreements and you agree to leave those things alone. And you also, you know, I described it as a 19 item checklist. I've seen places that made it an 80, 90 item checklist and it just, you suddenly realized the bureaucrats had taken over <laughs> and people just couldn't get stuff done and it just became like this eye roll, like, yeah, we're gonna do the checklist. That, you have to have it owned by the practitioners themselves. The list which, itself. The list itself has to be owned by the people in that room. Mm -hmm. And they have to make it come alive and agree as a community that we're creating this to go forward. And that's the difficult culture to get to. Um, it, it really is the difference between um, uh, going from cowboys to pit crews is what I've called it. You know, we, 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 are, we tend to be fighter pilots or the cowboys in the way we are 
trained, rewarded, and, um, and uh, certainly paid. <laughs> and taking time that's not in the operating room, not in the, not in the clinic you know, where you do get paid, to instead sit in a room and hammer out, here's what we believe is uh, great care. Mm -hmm. And then this is our system for making sure that those processes happen. And we're all brainstorming and inventing, how can I make that happen? It's a constant continuous improvement. It's a constant lift of where we're going. But I do believe you can transfer what's been learned in manufacturing about, you know, continually reinventing those processes, which again is about the front line um, being part of the, the manufacturing creation, the innovation and in how you manufacture. It's the same way in something like, even in something as complex as surgery. To your point about teamwork, um, in reading your books, surgery strikes me as a team sport. Uh, tell me if that's right or not. <laughs> um, what, what role does collaboration play play in continuous improvement and, and how, is, how important is it that people are working together um, and how do you, and if that's important, how do you promote that? Yeah, every surgeon would say surgery is a team sport. And yet, we have virtually no training, time, and focus on how you are more successful as a team in the operating room. We're not trained as teams, we don't practice as teams, we don't drill, we don't, so there's a whole bunch of things to bring in from the outside. So I think of our checklist work as, let's make sure the minimum floor of communication happens and that we're actually um, able to uh, identify what are our best practices and let's make sure we execute. There's a, there's a second level, which is coaching. Um, and, you know, I started experimenting after sort of following athletes and how teams do it, of having a coach, you know, fellow surgeon, come in the operating room, observe the team, give feedback, score, score, score the operation, and then, you know, what are the goals? What are we gonna work on improving for next time? And we've now deployed that at four different hospitals at Harvard where it continued to evaluate it. Our malpractice insurer has given us discounts for being able to have the teamwork in place because they're seeing uh, reasons that they believe that the malpractice rates are costs are going down from uh, taking those efforts. Let's talk for a minute about the coach you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you uh, you hired yourself a coach, I think, at one point in your career. Um, that's pretty unusual for surgeons, though. Though you know, if you were a quarterback, you'd always have a coach of a certain type. Um, uh, Why did you make that decision? Why do you Why do you think that's a bit unusual? Um, and um, do you still have a coach? <laughs> yeah. So my, I, I do. Um, I, for whatever reason, I've had the, um, I'm, I'm an optimizer, not a satisficer. <laughs> and so that continuous improvement sort of mentality has been there. And I end up getting a chance to interview and talk to a bunch of people who are in different kind of lines of performance. And the puzzle in my head was there is the kind of, um, there is the, the, the educational model that says, you get your 10,000 hours in, you become an expert, and you are on a self-improvement path. And that's the way healthcare, teaching, engineering, you know, lots of fields are, that's, that's the way. Get your practice, get your hours in, and then you're an expert, and then you go on from there. And then there's the way that the, the sports world works, which is, you know, Roger Federer, Rafa Nadal, Djokovic, you're number one and you still need coaching. You never don't need a coach. In fact, um, you can't be, the philosophy is you can't be expert. You can't be a master. You can't be number one without coaching, which is completely different philosophy. And so um, I was struck by how in music, um, some, like you go to Juilliard and you're a violinist or whatever, um, you are, there is no coaching. Whereas opera singers have coaches. So have voice coaches. So why? I didn't understand that. So I asked Itzhak Perlman, why do, I got a chance to interview him, you know, the greatest violinist of a generation. Um, why, do you, why do violinists not have a coach? And he said, I don't know, but I always did. He has a coach. He married <laughs> a fellow student in Juilliard, also a master violinist, who eventually gave up her career to sit and coach him. Uh, and she watches every performance. 
She's learned, do not give him this feedback right after the performance. Right after the performance, that was great. That was awesome. The next day, over breakfast, how'd you think you did in that middle section? Did it seem a little wooden to you? <laughs> and that has been, he said, critical to his rising to that level. You know, more and more executives have coaches. I actually got an executive coach when I first started having to lead teams and then institutions. Um, and translating that into an operating room, just asking someone to come observe and be a good coach for me, we had to learn like what does a coach do? I'd say there's a couple of key things. One is that they are an external source of truth. They will observe you and then give you truth about what, how you're doing, a 360 feedback in a, per, in a single person. Um, and then the second is that they are able to set goals with you and um, monitor and support your progress in making those goals. They don't have to be experts. You know, I don't think Bill, Bill Belichick for the Patriots played football himself or hadn't for a long time. Um, whereas, um, uh, but could be you know, a phenomenal team coach by providing that combination. Going back to checklists for a minute, um, when, you, when you go about writing these checklists, like what, what makes a good checklist? Like what are the characteristics um, that, you're, that you're looking for and that you're, what, what are you trying to achieve there? So um, I've seen it done a number of ways, but I think the fundamental thing is uh, you need a source of information uh, for what the variation in practice is. Um, so you need to be able to see what are five, 10 different ways that people are doing these operations or whatever else you're trying to build the uh, checklist around. And do you have any indicator of what the best, what the positive deviant is am among them? Who, who is getting the better results? One way to do that is you have the data and then that's more straightforward. Often we don't have the data and then it's about getting people uh, those people in a room and trying to say, what are the reasons why these are here and, and uh, can we craft what the, what the best practice is? Um, I'm, I'm drawn to places where you have actual distribution in results uh, and it doesn't seem random. It seems like there is actually uh, an out, a set of outliers. And then when your ideal world is you get people in a room and you discuss it, um, uh, sorry, your ideal world is not that you get people in a room and discuss it, but you actually get to go and watch and see how people do it. And so walking around and going and seeing how people actually do their job, you will start to realize, you know, who the, the major outliers are um, if you have that data and you observe many of those top outliers and you realize they are almost always doing intentional things that you can take and create intention around everybody else. You know, communication was one example. I was shocked that one of the most important items on our surgery checklist was that in the outlier rooms, the teams talked to one another, um, you know, in one place we looked at, they introduce themselves by name at the start of the day and you don't even realize most operating room teams are new every day. Mm -hmm. You'll have a traveling nurse, you'll have someone who's subbing in and you introduce yourself because just like in a conference room, someone getting to say their name and what my role is means they're much more likely to speak up later and they feel heard to begin with and they feel in included in part of the team saying, you know, explicitly, what's our goal in this operation? What are our concerns this person has? And people were doing that in, in, uh, in some outlier places that were getting better outlier results. What did you, uh, what did you learn from uh, airlines or pilots uh, as part of this process? So many things. Uh, first of all, um, Boeing puts out checklists to each of the airlines. Uh, each airline, most of the airlines remake the checklists. So for example, I forget which airlines are which, one of them tends to leave more room for judgment. And, um, and so they focus on kind of the big killer items, but um, you know, a little more flexibility in procedures. Others are very like, you know, strict by the book, want it laid out in incredible, de more detail than the Boeing has. And, uh, and it's fascinating when airlines merge you have to decide what culture you're actually getting and the unions, unions will get into battles over this issue. 
But um, I'd say the second thing is they were issuing and continually changing and uh, updating uh, those and retraining on them you know, every six months or so. So they had a process for saying, we expect change. We expect feedback. We expect learning. And we will keep on, keep on uh, changing and, and, uh, and adapting. Hospitals who've done this well, who've created this, uh, or, or hospital systems that have done this well in terms of creating this continuous improvement, what have, what have they done differently? What are, what, are the, what are the, across all your work at this point, what, what, are, your, what are your big takeaways if you know, the, the CEO of a major hospital system called you and said, like, what do I, what do I really need to do? What, what are the levers? I've come to realize that becoming a effective system is a skill just like becoming an expert individual. It's, ten, I don't know what the, the 10,000 hours equivalent is of the organization, but for example, when we went into the state of South Carolina, um, there were systems that could adopt within three months because they have done quality change before. They have, um, they have expectations that you will be constantly improving and that we will be assessing and getting through this. And they have a culture that has built around that and, and enabled it. And so it really is, um, do you have people dedicated to this effort? Have I resourced this? And are they able to do this not on the side of their desk, but they see it as a central part of what they do? and that they, they then develop skills and experience and start teaching others how to do it and then are able to implement it because you're really making a transition from you know, a, uh, a group of cowboys to a pit crew that can move in sync. Tool, thank you so much for joining us. This was fascinating. Hi, I'm Nick, the CEO and co-founder here at Domino. First of all, thank you, Atul. The work you are doing is amazing, and I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to learn from you. Atul just spoke about unleashing exceptional performance in surgery and how some of the same principles have improved performance in air travel, construction, and other professions. I want to talk about unleashing exceptional performance in data science. Now, you might be wondering, what does data science have to do with surgery, or for that matter, with air travel or construction? Well, there's some deep similarities. They involve highly skilled professionals interacting with complex systems and specialized tools. They depend on communication and collaboration across different roles with different perspectives. Mistakes and errors can stay hidden and have delayed but severe consequences. And the biggest similarity, they've had a massive leveraged impact, transforming every aspect of society from how we work to what we eat, to how we stay connected, even how long we live. Actually, I'd argue the biggest difference with data science is that we're still in early days of seeing that impact unfold. Surgery and air travel have been around for over a century, and in that time, they've dramatically matured as disciplines, driving huge improvements, both in terms of throughput and safety. In the last 50 years, for example, the number of commercial passenger miles flown has increased 1,000%, while the rate of fatal accidents has declined by a factor of 10. Or by the 1920s, Surgeries were done by teams of people and modern anesthesia was in use, but nearly one in 10 patients died on the operating table. Today, that number is less than one in 100. If we improve data science by a similar magnitude, it would be world changing. By accelerating time to market for new medicine, data science will save millions of lives. It's helping companies design safer cars, helping farmers grow more efficient crops to feed the world. It'll help health organizations spot early warning signs for the next pandemic. So how do we unleash exceptional performance from data science? To answer that question, first we have to define what we mean by performance, then look at what's holding it back, and then what we can do about it. So how do we measure the performance of a data science organization? Well, ultimately, it's the impact on business outcomes, like increasing revenue or reducing costs or improving customer experience. But in practice, business outcomes can be overdetermined and lag significantly behind the data science work. So it would be more practical to have a more direct measure. To simplify, we could start by saying, data scientists produce models and model-backed analyses and insights. So to a first order, a good metric might be the number of models that impact some decision or outcome. But models are probabilistic. They degrade over time. And more generally, continuous incremental improvement leads to compounding gains. So instead of counting each model once, 
We should also count each time a model is updated to improve a decision or an outcome. This is a team's model velocity. It's the rate of model additions and updates that impact the business. And just like how engineering teams measure their feature velocity, it reflects both the quantity and the magnitude of changes. In other words, data science teams increase model velocity by delivering more models, updating models more frequently, and making bigger changes. So what's holding model velocity back? Why isn't your team delivering twice or three times its current velocity? You know, it's funny, every company is investing heavily in data science and machine learning. I mean, it's practically a cliche to call it a strategic imperative. But most data science teams still run into constant friction that slows their progress. What I mean by friction is, at every step of the life cycle, data scientists struggle with issues that distract them from the core work they're trying to do. These are like paper cuts or pebbles in your shoe during a hike. They don't stop your progress, and you might get desensitized to them, but they drag you down and they hold you back. It's like walking in a thick mud. Everything is just slower and harder than it needs to be. When data scientists describe this friction, it clusters around three fundamental elements that make data science unique. Compute, data, and models. By compute, I mean the infrastructure the data scientists need. Data scientists waste tons of time configuring and debugging infrastructure, if they can even get access to the resources they need in the first place. This happens because most companies aren't wired to handle the unique infrastructure and software needs of modern data science techniques and workloads. One of our customers described how some models would run for days because they were running on data scientists' laptops. Another lamented they missed research opportunities because it was so hard to set up the right infrastructure. Or an all too common scenario, two data scientists couldn't collaborate because they had different packages installed on their machines and couldn't run each other's code. Next, let's talk about data. Despite decades of effort to help analysts and business intelligence use cases, working with data still presents enormous friction for data scientists. It's way too hard to find and use the data they need. They have to look in dozens of different places. They may not have proper access and require IT help to get it. Different teams reinvent the wheel, writing different data access code. It is a mess. Finally, let's talk about models themselves. Models are a new type of digital asset for most businesses, and they're weird. They're probabilistic, and they behave differently from more traditional IT assets like software. So data scientists run into friction, getting them deployed, monitoring them, updating them, validating them. Basically every step of safely crossing the last mile to get models actually affecting real business outcomes. As one of our customers put it, we built a lot of great models, but we would time and again fail at getting them into production. And if we did, it would take us a lot of time to maintain them. When I think about the root causes for these friction points, I'm reminded of some of the challenges a tool described in operating rooms. Performing common tasks requires manual work that's prone to error. There's no single way to do things, so work gets reinvented. It's hard to collaborate and communicate with people in different roles who all need to work together. So what can we do about it? How do data science teams remove friction and increase model velocity? One of the most inspiring insights from a tool's work is that improving performance comes from things that are simple, not sexy. Automating common tasks so the right way to do something is also the easiest way. Creating systems that increase consistency. Doing certain things the same way every time. And increasing communication and collaboration, especially across different roles. Think about the operating room before and after the work a tool described where you previously had surgeons do whatever they thought was best based on their experience, you now have collective wisdom systemized in procedures and checklists. When good or bad outcomes happen, the lessons learned go back into the procedures to benefit future teams and patients. Working this way drives better outcomes and faster continuous improvement. And the good news is it requires discipline and collaboration, but not any medical or technical breakthroughs. Similarly, in a complex domain like data science, there are no silver bullet tools or algorithms. The way to improve performance is by changing how people work, not what they work on or what they work with. This has always been our vision for Domino, a platform that accelerates model velocity by changing how teams work. 
By automating best practices, creating more consistency, and increasing collaboration, Domino is like a flywheel that helps data science teams get faster at getting better. Let me give you an example. When we first launched Domino, our novel idea was to make data scientists keep their work in a central place rather than on their own computers. That's a simple concept that changes how teams work, but not the content of their work. But it makes it possible to automate more steps, easier to share work, and easier for future colleagues to learn from the past. That simple change transformed how teams work, and some of our customers told us their research became 10 times faster. Now, the research firm Forrester did an analysis of how Domino accelerates velocity for data science teams. And here's some of the findings they reported from our customers. With Domino, spinning up infrastructure went from two to three weeks to one click. Onboarding new data scientists went from weeks to 20 minutes. And those benefits compounded because Domino created a standardized way to do data science, creating consistency across the team. And by unlocking collaboration, making it easy to share insights across people and teams. Today, we are taking Domino to the next level. We are introducing Domino 5.0 with groundbreaking new capabilities that unleash model velocity. Our engineering team has been working on some of these capabilities for over a year, and I am incredibly proud of what we built. Domino 5 is going to be a game changer for data science teams, and I cannot wait for you to see it. To show you more, I'd like to welcome our chief data scientist, Josh Paduska. Thanks, Nick. Hello, everyone. I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to show you a few of the groundbreaking new features we're introducing in Domino 5. But before I do, I'd like to give you a brief introduction to the Domino Enterprise MLOps platform. Domino is designed to address the unique needs of large enterprises doing advanced data science and machine learning. In fact, Domino is trusted by 20% of the Fortune 100 and many of the Global 2000. Domino is the central engine for enterprise MLOps. It is open and flexible. It runs on Kubernetes, in the cloud or on-premise. It lets data scientists use the tools they love while self-serving the right hardware and Docker environments. It accelerates data science team collaboration by automatically capturing the unique assets of data science work for full reproducibility. It enables standardization of processes without DevOps barriers to take models from development to deployment and on to monitoring. Domino does all this with a focus on scale, governance, and security that IT stakeholders are searching for as they manage enterprise data science complexities. Let's take a quick look at the platform. This is Domino. All work is organized into projects with purpose-built features for data science. When doing exploratory analysis or building a model, Domino lets you spin up self-serve sandbox environments we call workspaces. With a few clicks, data scientists get to choose familiar tools, open tools like JupyterLab, VS Code, or RStudio, as well as commercial favorites like MATLAB. They also choose their preferred infrastructure, CPUs, GPUs, and more. By removing DevOps friction, Domino lets teams test and develop more ideas faster. As data scientists use Domino, it automatically captures key units of work that are linked together. Domino becomes an internal data science knowledge base that is searchable. A search thread can be followed down to individual experiments. Each experiment tracks results and details about the hardware, Docker images, and code used. There's no more friction trying to find past work, reproduce it, or reinvent the wheel. After a model or analysis is ready, Domino makes it easy for data scientists to publish it as an API, integrate it in a web app, or deploy it as a scheduled job. Once a model is published, Domino can automate the process of data capture needed to monitor drift and ensure ongoing model health. By removing the friction of MLOps throughout the lifecycle, we let teams get more models into production quicker, increasing model velocity and business impact. Okay, now that we've had an introduction to Domino, I am thrilled to introduce you to Domino 5. It has groundbreaking new features that will increase model velocity for data science teams. I'm going to show you a few features across three core elements of data science, compute, data, and models. First, let's talk about compute. Many of the modern data science models that produce so much value require different infrastructure and frameworks than were needed just a few years ago. 
Examples include GPUs and distributed clusters with their associated frameworks. Unfortunately, most data science teams can't access that kind of power, nor are they engineering experts able to configure Kubernetes and debug distributed systems. We have two exciting announcements regarding compute infrastructure. I am proud to announce that Domino 5 is the first MLOps platform validated for the NVIDIA AI Enterprise Suite. Together, Domino and NVIDIA AI Enterprise put unprecedented power at data scientists' fingertips. With a single click, Domino ensures the NVIDIA GPU experience is seamless, so data scientists can focus on modern research, such as multi-node GPU training using frameworks like Ray, instead of dealing with vexing DevOps headaches. This integration also gives IT peace of mind with a stack that's well-integrated, supported, tested, and cost-effective. The second big infrastructure announcement in Domino 5 is auto-scaling clusters. With auto-scaling clusters, data scientists can attach a distributed compute cluster to their workspace that will elastically scale up and down to meet workload needs. In keeping with our commitment to openness and flexibility, we built auto-scaling clusters to work with three of the most common distributed compute frameworks for data science, going beyond Spark to include Ray and Dask as well. As this distributed Ray workload maximizes the available resources of the cluster, new nodes are automatically added. And to save costs, it will also scale down when demand drops. The power of GPUs on NVIDIA AI Enterprise and the power of distributed compute with auto-scaling clusters give data scientists unprecedented access to infrastructure. We can't wait to see how this accelerates model velocity. Next, let's talk about data. One of the most common complaints we hear from data scientists is that they spend too much time looking for and getting access to the data they need. And even when they find it, it can be painful to get network connectivity or install the right drivers. Lots of delays that slow progress. Many products have superficial wizards to manage connection strings, but that doesn't solve the deep issue. We stripped this problem down to the studs and built an innovative solution from first principles. If you look at the highest performing data science teams, they all have some sort of data access layer that provides a common interface to different data sources and handles things like security and connectivity. This requires a lot of complex engineering. Domino 5 makes this powerful capability available to all data science teams. We call this feature Data Connectors. We built a high performance data access server that functions as a unified gateway to make diverse data sources accessible through a common SQL-like syntax while handling security, auditing, and other enterprise requirements. As researchers define different connections, those can be shared and reused across the organization. To use a connector, you just click a button to add it to your project. There's no need to install drivers, configure connections, wrestle with network access, or learn the details of a new query interface. Data connectors make it easy for data scientists to find, manage, secure, and use the data they need. And now for our final announcement of the day. This will be an absolute game changer for data science organizations. You've probably seen a diagram like this before. It's a common depiction of the data science lifecycle. It's always shown as a loop, implying that once a model is in production, it's easy to monitor and then retrain and redeploy. But for most organizations, the reality is that this is a broken loop. Moving a model into production and back through the life cycle is time consuming, ad hoc, and anything but smooth. From approving the distribution of goods and services to diagnosing diseases, more and more models are being incorporated into production systems that affect each of us. The risk associated with failing models has never been higher. Today, we're announcing two features that make this closed loop a reality and help ensure the health of deployed models. We call them integrated monitoring and model quality insights. Integrated monitoring makes building monitoring pipelines easy. Once you deploy a model, you can select your training data that was captured by Domino during development, and then boom, monitoring is enabled. You can easily configure checks and automatic alerts for data and for model drift. Domino will then connect to your live prediction data and automate a continuous monitoring pipeline. Your model is then stored in a model registry, a single pane of glass that shows models, monitoring summaries, alerts, and drift details. When problems arise with model accuracy, Domino automatically generates a model quality report 
This report highlights issues in your model and data. It includes a number of analyses automatically generated by Domino to help data scientists diagnose drift. Finding bad models and highlighting the root cause is huge, but it's not the whole story. Remediating models is notoriously difficult. In Domino 5, with one click from the model homepage, you can spin up a development environment with the original reconstituted state of your models. When your workspace spins up, it will have the original code, notebooks, training data, and Docker image used to build the model, along with the production data needed to debug, analyze, and compare. And when you've made your changes and retrained, deployment and monitoring of the new model version are just a few clicks away. Integrated model monitoring and model quality insights are fantastic new tools that finally complete the loop of continuous data science improvement. Today, you've seen how Domino removes DevOps barriers across the data science lifecycle. You've seen robust support for NVIDIA and distributed cluster workloads. You've seen an innovative approach to reusable data connectors. You've seen model monitoring deeply integrated into an MLOps pipeline. Domino 5 delivers on the promise of MLOps, faster laps around the track, continuous improvement, automated best practices, and less friction for data scientists. We are so excited about Domino 5 and look forward to helping companies across all industries unleash model velocity. One company that's already investing deeply in accelerating model velocity is Johnson & Johnson. And that's why I can't wait to hear from our next special guest, Najat Khan. Thanks, Josh. I'm Thomas Robinson, Head of Partnerships at Domino Data Lab. I work with our partners like NVIDIA and our customers like Johnson & Johnson in the health sciences space. I'm joined today by Dr. Najat Khan. She's the Chief Data Science Officer and Global Head of Strategy and Operations for Janssen R&D. She's also the co-chair of the Johnson & Johnson Data Science Council. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I'd love to start with, if you can just set the stage for us a little bit about um, data science at, at Johnson & Johnson. Um, what does your team look like? How does it impact the mission of the organization? Thank you so much for having me, Tom. It's great to be here. So the mission and the purpose of data science at J&J is one and the same with the overarching mission and credo of J&J, which is to improve the trajectory of human health. And we're using data science to do that in a couple of ways. In the pharmaceutical sector, we are leveraging data science to improve the probability that a therapy or an innovation actually becomes a transformational medicine for patients and to do this better and faster. In our medical device sector, we're actually using digital surgery and robotics to improve the experience and the outcomes for our patients. And the same in consumer health. So this is end-to-end -end across j and the impact and the use of data science. But let me try to make it real with an example. So for instance, you know, imagine if you're a patient that unfortunately has been diagnosed with cancer. And now there are certain mutations where there's a treatment that can improve the outcome for that for you. But increasingly, it's harder to find those patients because these mutations are new and therefore are not sequenced on a regular basis. But remember, every single patient gets a biopsy. So what we have done using data science is digitize those pathology, those biopsy slides, and then actually used AI machine learning to be able to predict what mutation a patient might have just from those images. So with that, the impact of that is you can find patients who may otherwise have been undiagnosed, or you can find them earlier. That is a significant impact for patients. And we're not just building a nice algorithm and publishing it. We are actually looking at how can we deploy it in clinical trials so that they work as well as possible in the real world setting. To me, that's impact. And that's the impact that data science is having at J&J. That's great. Um, you mentioned teams. Uh, talk to me a little bit about how you uh, uh, engender collaboration in your teams. Yeah, I mean, um, first of all, every single project that we are working on, every single use case, as we call them, I always say step back and make sure every single action is actually delivering something for a patient. Again, I want to emphasize the application base. If you'd stay in theory for too long, 
a lot of these new disciplines lose their momentum and steam because people say you can't apply it to data uh, to healthcare. So that's one. The second, which is really important, is to ensure that data scientists and scientists or others that are in the field before are co-citizens, are equal. And they're sitting around the table on ideating on what the problem is all the way through, iterating, interpreting the analysis, and executing. The reason that's important is you don't want these different perspectives and point of views to get diluted. Like a tool's example about the surgeon and everybody else in the OR, you need to have every an inclusive culture, not just for the sake of being inclusive, but inclusive in decision making. Those are very two different things, right? Because if your if your input doesn't get to the decision making point, then we haven't made true progress. So that's another piece. And then the third thing I'd say is, you know, it doesn't matter if you're like an SVP or an analyst or you're inside the walls of j j or outside. A smart idea can come from anywhere. Mm. And actually having the humility and open-mindedness to accept that is something I push a lot in my teams. Because that's the only way you truly collaborate, not just with the person who's across the table, but opening up to all of the different ideas so that you are, again, competing to win, not just doing something because you're checking the box. That's great. Um, let me dig into that a little bit more. Um, so a couple of things that you mentioned, creating an overall culture and, and, and probably, I imagine, at a large organization trying to drive change. How do you accomplish that? How do you, how do you build the culture of your data science team and, and your stakeholders holders more broadly? And how do you, uh, how do, you do that change management as you uh, evolve the culture? Yeah, I feel like the last couple of years or so, that's been a huge focus. You know, I'll tell you, when I first took on the role, a lot of people said, look, Najat, you know, take six months, a year, build a strategy. Um, you know, really do a listening tour, build a strategy, take time, build the foundations, you know, our data is fragmented everywhere. That doesn't work, you can't scale. All that is very important. But it's also important, like I was saying before, to really early on move data science or any new discipline from theory to action, to impact. So you can't wait uh, you know, for a year, two years, and honestly, the technology changes as we all know by then. So you know, as you mentioned when you introduced me, I have two roles. I head up data science, but I also head up strategy, which means I'm deeply steeped in the pipeline. Mm. The pipeline is the engine that drives any pharmaceutical company. Why is that important? Because knowing your pipeline, your portfolio, through and through means that you can actually look at that and say, what are the priorities that are going to make a difference for the business outcome? That's the first thing I did, whether it's the COVID-19 vaccine or many other questions that we have in our pipeline, like the one I mentioned. And then you say, okay, how much of this can be solved using data science? Is it feasible? So have a portfolio of like short-term, long-term use cases, make sure it's diverse because you don't know what's going to work. And then while you build the platforms like talent, like um, having one place where you have all your data, all of that is supremely important, but actually solve those use cases early on. And we were able to do that. And that's what created that momentum. Because people, you go from a push of data science to a pull. People see that it's actually creating a difference and we are you know, in the lead. Everybody, I mean, it's a simple philosophy for humans. Everybody likes to be part of the winning team. Right. So the best way to get people to be on your team is to win. And to win, you have to take the hard work of figuring out where you'll win and go all at it. And I think that a lot of the times folks don't do that. So that would be one way we've been able to create that cultural change. The other thing I would say is also the talent you hire. Hmm. You know, we really focus on, and I have, on bringing in bilingual talent. So talent that's proficient in data science, for sure, that's their primary role, but also in medical science. So folks that understand clinical development, they understand science, they can speak that language. That builds that credibility and that connectivity needed with scientists and operations leads so you're working as one team so that you don't get siloed. I think that integration and being embedded is of critical importance. And then you start to see them working as a new blended team. And that is really important. And now, one of the biggest challenges is finding bilingual talent isn't easy. Like the, dis the challenge is the discipline in itself is new. 
So you have to be able to develop talent that may have one or the other space. We actually have folks that were, you know, more on the science side that now are data scientists too, or data scientists that have picked up the scientific language. That is also critical to get that um, buy-in and the traction in the organization. That's great. Um, you've mentioned technology a couple of times. Yeah. Maybe tell me what role technology plays in um, accelerating the performance of your, your data science team. You know, one huge foundation um, to do data science at scale um, and to ensure the right collaboration happens is to have a really good end-to-end -end pipeline or platform, I should say. Um, it's almost think about it like a house, it's a foundation, right? And um, step one of that is data sets are generally really fragmented mm. in any large organization. And so one of the things I did when I took on the role is I said, we need to really look at all of the different data sets we have, not just put them in a data lake, but actually have them linked and connected and then have a place where you can, you know, it's a GitHub of sorts, like you can build the models that you need and then ensure that it's reproducible so that one data scientist can actually, doesn't have to start from scratch, can use one and knows the name associated. This is like basic collaboration, but you know, especially in a COVID world, it's harder to do. You're not in the same office. So having, and then the right regulatory platforms and then have the same platform where you can build all the applications so that it's not just data scientists using it, but scientists, et cetera. So we have an end-to-end -end platform just like that called med.ai, where we have integrated our preclinical to our real world, the so imaging, lab results, this, that, you know, clinical trial data. Um, and it's we have over two terabytes of data in one place. And, um, and the platform that we have where we're building models and we partner with Domino on that, really has been one of the underpinnings of being able to scale. When I say go from 10 to 100, now actually probably 150 plus projects, over 90% um, coverage of the pipeline, you can't do that unless you have a standardized way of having all the data, models, applications in one place. And I'll tell you, from a recruitment perspective, it's huge because the one thing data scientists don't want to do is to search for data. Sure or search for models and search for Excel sheets and search for who they should talk to. We need to do better there. That's great. Um, maybe uh, just passing on some advice, what advice would you have for other uh, executives or data science leaders um, uh, to you know, increase their uh, delivery rate of models, to increase the accuracy, to embed that in the organization? Maybe give some advice. Yeah, I mean, you know, I have to say the first thing starts with what are you trying to solve for? If you don't get the what right and you do the how, you can do technology first. You have to think about what are those business outcomes you're trying to achieve. So knowing the pipeline really well and having the strategy set is one of the starting points for sure. I would say in parallel, you don't want to spend too much time in theory. Hmm. You want to get to action. Take a couple of important things solve for it, right? And and really solve for it. And no, don't just externalize it to somebody. Like, I'll tell you, we we have done th over 35 partnerships in the last year. J&J &J is really big on the smartest idea inside, outside. We're very agnostic. But you have to have a good team that's discerning on what good looks like, right? So having, building that team, building that team of bilingual data scientists, having that platform we just talked about to be able to scale, all that is important, but it first comes down to getting traction early on with a couple of quick ones that are done well. And then using that momentum to build that across um, the organization. It's not enough to just say we're gonna have a digital transformation. If you don't actually put the work and the elbow grease into it, be willing to roll up your sleeves and solve for a couple of those big problems. The last thing I will say, a tip, is change management is hard. Mm -hmm right? It's hard. It can be emotional. So it's really important to stay resilient as a data scientist all the way to the leadership that really mandated this to begin with. And, and be re resilient, but then also stay the course, mm. right? Every time you don't and you get distracted by a different thing, it's really hard to bring this back up again. There's a frictional cost to that. So I think as a leadership, like really, if you're gonna do this, mean it and lean in 
on a daily basis, not just when there's a cool town hall or whatever. So that's very important. I say the same to, to the data scientists. It's so easy to jump from one role to another, but to see something through, there's a certain sense of pride if your mission is to help patients. And that doesn't take a few months. That takes a little bit longer. It's more than the algorithm or the publication. It's really like, you know, going into the sites, the system, is it being used? What's the issue? Like, it's a lot of nuts and bolts. But once you come through it, the, the reward is really worth it. When that first patient gets diagnosed early because of something you did, there's nothing else that parallels that feeling. Najat, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. I've learned a lot. I'm sure our audience has, uh, has learned a lot from the session too. No, thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed the discussion. Great. With that, I'm going to hand it back to Nick. Thank you so much to our speakers, Dr. Atul Gawande and Dr. Najat Khan. If you liked what you saw here today, I have one more thing to tell you about. After a two-year hiatus, Rev is coming back. It's going to be in New York City, May 4th through the 6th. We're going to have incredible speakers, including Nobel laureate Jennifer Dudna and best-selling author James Clear. It's going to be amazing. I can't wait, and I really hope to see you all there. Thank you all so much.